Hi everyone, welcome to Aussie Vision. This is Craig here and I am joined today by three very, very special guests. We have Dave, Jean-Paul and Sean from the Busca. G'day boys, how are you? All good over here. I am really well, thank you. It's been a very long day, but I'm so, so glad to meet you guys. Um, I'm a big fan um, and I'm really excited to see what you guys do in Liverpool. Um, I hear you guys have just got off a plane back from Madrid. How has that been? You were performing at the pre-parties. How has your experience there been uh, at the last few of those? So uh, we did uh, Warsaw, um, Tel Aviv and, and uh, Madrid. Um, definitely, they all have been a, a learning process and uh, a moment for us to experience our song and experience um, performing in a non-competitive setting. I'm getting to know all the other contestants and as much as possible, um, just making sure that we enjoy enjoy the time um, before the competition and before things get a bit more stressful. <laughs> so things aren't stressful yet then, that's good to hear. Um, I must say that you guys really do know how to work a crowd. Um, the way that, like, when you get started, people, like, you know, even if they're not into it, by the end of it, they are bopping along from the clips I have seen. Um, going back, we're taking a step back for a moment. Um, you guys have been around since 2012, I understand. It's quite a long-standing group and some people have come and gone. So can you tell us a story about how the group came together and what are you inspired by? What sort of music does the busker do? Who is the busker musically? So the busker started in 2012, as you said, 11 years ago, actually. Um, it started out by busking in the streets of Malt. That was myself and a friend of mine. And we both shared the same passion for songwriting and to, to live performances. So when we created the band, uh, our aim was to actually gig uh, in Malta and even abroad and also release our own original material. Uh, along the way, Sean joined the band as well. Um, during at the time, our style was more um, inspired by uh, by sixties music, uh, like Bob Dylan, the Beatles, the Beach Boys. But then, when Sean joined the band, we sort of progressed more into into blues, funk, and uh, rockabilly. Um, then, fast forward to twenty twenty, uh, Dave joined the group, uh, which finally us as as the trio that we are known to today. And uh, again, our our music kept on evolving, and uh, now we should just more into soul, uh, funk, and um, combined with a bit of electronic music as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I had to listen to your uh, album, ladies and gentlemen, and like, there's so much different stuff going on there. I'm like, there is definitely the soul and the blues influences, but also sort of a yeah. theatrical edge, which really gives you guys a point of difference. I think so. I love that about you guys. Um, I've heard on the grapevine from other interviews that you guys prepared your entry for MESC in 30 days. Um, so can you tell me how that happened? How did that come about? And what did that 30 days look like? How did you not just run around like chooks with your heads cut off? Yeah, um, I think it was the first time as a band that we started the project and finished it in a, such a short span of time. I think we were used to letting things breathe before going back to them and, you know, working as we go along. So that was quite an experience for us because um, every day you, we're, we were kind of forced to um, reevaluate from the previous session and see what's next, what's better, what we can improve and stuff like that. Um, to be completely honest, the... There were there was some work on the song um, prior to those thirty days, but um, as as a lot of people who experience songwriting and production um, would confirm, it's it's uh, even though there would be a bit of work started, you still um, kind of strip it all out and and start afresh. Mm. I think um, started from the saxophone riff. Is that the case? Sorry. Did it start with the saxophone riff? That was the first thing that came and then the rest of it built up around it? Um, it um, not exactly. I think the first thing that came along was actually the bass line. Yeah. Um, so it started from that and uh, ba -da -ba 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 -ba. then the saxophone, um, it just flowed out. Yeah, yeah, no, I hear that. And one of the things I really like about this song is that it's almost like the sort of anti-club banger in that it's got like, 
It's very danceable. It's very catchy. But then you're sort of sitting at ho- singing about sitting at home and sitting on the couch. Um, and there's that nice sort of little contrast there. Uh, without wanting to ask a personal question, does that come from personal experience? Or like, where did that idea or a concept for the song come from? I think it is a bit of personal experience. Um, I think the the what the narrative of it is basically um, being kind to yourself when your social anxiety is acting up and uh, allowing yourself to just take yourself out of a situation where you're not feeling your best and, and care for, for that part of you which um, wants to enjoy and, and relax um, in a setting where you feel most comfortable in. Um, in our case, it was trying to refer to the fact that post-COVID there was uh, an expectation or or this kind of idea that everything is back to normal, but the social distancing and, and the fear of one another was ingrained in us to the point where we couldn't just act um, normal once we're in a social setting. So... Uh, we take we took that sentiment and and translated into a song and in, into the sense that sometimes it's just best for you to just leave um uh, some a place where you're not feeling your best and just enjoy the time with people you like with songs that you like. That's a message I can get behind right there. Um, I first encountered you guys in Mesk a few months ago, and I loved you from the moment I saw the like live audition sort of showing up with the purple screen and you sort of didn't have much preparation. As a bit of a mesk nerd, can you talk me through what happened there? Because it seemed like everyone was just sort of stood there, they pointed a camera at you and they sort of said, sing. So was that basically what happened or was there more to it? No, basically that was it. <laughs> <laughs> basically, um, they um, from, from the production side, they wanted to challenge um, uh, mesk in the sense that previous years, I think, um people didn't um the audience didn't have a chance to hear the song for just the song rather than than uh, on on the semifinals night where there was the performance with dancers and and visuals and the whole staging so it was an opportunity for um artists and the audience to present the song and solely the song um and nothing more than that i personally think it was a good decision um, because they 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 stripped everything away from everyone, so it was just about the song, and and the the writing of the song, which um, I believe is is the fundamentals of the Eurovision Song Contest. I mean, it's in the name. Uh, I yeah. definitely can get behind that, but I wanted to know when you obviously got further through the competition, you get staging, you get other elements, you get all the bells and whistles. How much of that came from you? Like, how much was it, like, did you guys just go down to here and find yourself a park bench? Or was there, like, help from the broadcaster? So how much of it is your creative vision and how much have you had outside assistance and outside advice in preparing that? There are, there are two aspects to that question. One is the creative side of it, where the ideas came from. Um, now, John and David are always two very creative people when it comes to these sort of things, and they come with the wild ideas. I'm usually the one which is pale-faced and wondering how it's going to work, <laughs> you know? Um, and then there was there was Steve, our creative director, who came into the plot um, right around the quarterfinal stage, very late in his opinion, also in ours. Um, <laughs> and when, when, obviously, he started to give his two cents to the ideas that the boys came up with, they, they started to make a bit more sense as well and started to connect, you know? He started to help bring everything together into a context. And basically, when we were planning the staging, everything was planned backstage because we did, had no idea what the stage was like, you know. It was the first time for us. So the plot for us, we wanted to fill the whole stage, but we didn't realize that half the stage pl- plotting was backstage on the ramp, you know. Yeah. So before he came along, it was all on the ramp and backstage. Um, but then there's the other side of it, which is the actual physical creation of the propage themselves, you know? Yeah, yeah. And that's where that's where we had to put a lot of elbow grease in, because nearly everything we had on stage was either made by us, ordered by us, brought in by us, or glued and attached to the platforms by us. So you could say that every part of what you saw on the stage, given the choreography, the, the song, the platforms, the, the staging, the ideas behind the staging, you can basically put all of those to us. So... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, pardon my language, but that's bloody impressive. Um, <laughs> who, whose idea was the um? 
whose idea was the cardboard cutouts of like Irolosco and Destiny and stuff? Where did that come from? And how did they come? It was their very own. And initially, the idea was to have cutouts. They weren't meant to be Eurovision singers at first. They were just meant to be cutouts, you know, just to create a feeling of a party, you know, using silhouettes and maybe some lights and all of this. But then it evolved into having previous Eurovision winners there as the party, you know? Yeah, yeah. well, it made me laugh. So job done. Uh, And among all this, you guys have day jobs as well, like many of the contestants do. So, like, how has that been, like, balancing all this sort of performance, all this preparations and stuff, just like along with being people who have lives and jobs and families and stuff, how's life changed since winning Mask and how are you managing that? Well, I think mostly just got busier at the moment. Um, uh, we definitely are, are loving the fact that for once and for the first time, I think in our lives, um, we are seen as as who we believe are, are, is our true selves as as artists and musicians, um, and we're being respected for the work that we did. Um, we we always were kind of hard workers, and we always rolled up our sleeves and made music the center of our lives. Um, and to that, many of the times we didn't um, get the kind of reward. You know that that we felt um, uh, reflected the amount of work we're putting in. Mm. So I think for the first time we're feeling um, a bit satisfied with with uh, that the satisfaction and reward and and the hard work are leveled. Yeah, no. So I, from I, the expected internal change, kind of that's um, it. It helped us feel a bit more assured with ourselves. I'm so glad to hear that. You guys deserve it. You guys are really, really talented. And I've been so impressed seeing how you've moved along, even just seeing from performance to performance. I noticed that one thing you said in the earlier sort of interviews I've seen, you weren't the most confident with choreography. Has that sort of developed? Are you getting more confident as time goes on? David looks like J-Lo now. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think... um, uh... At first, uh, we weren't confident with the fact that our choreography is, is kind of simple. You know, mm. we were um, we 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 felt. I mean, at a point, we might have felt that uh, or questioned if it's enough. Um, but I think the fact that how how it how it how we move um, is so easily replicated that gets um, everyone join joins in so basically anyone can join in with with the simple choreography and i think that's the character of, of what we want to portray as well terrific terrific and that's definitely come across in all the pre-parties as well that i can see look i won't take up too much more of your time i've only got one or two more questions um first australia i don't know if you know this but australia actually has the biggest population of maltese people outside of malta there's nearly yeah, 250 yes. 000 of them um so do you have anything you'd like to say? We, we hear from our Maltese, like, engage, uh, Maltese followers all the time. So is there anything you'd like to say to like the Maltese population of Australia who are very much behind you from everything I've seen on social media? Well, first and foremost, uh, I would like to take the opportunity to say, I mean, hi to everyone in Australia. Um, as a band, I think, um, uh, we we separately before I was part of the band the um the busker were actually part of a commercial in Australia yeah, yeah. yes and and uh, I I spent eight months in Australia um I spent eight months in Melbourne I'm yep. in Melbourne right now yeah cool um yeah I spent some time in Taylor's Lakes oh terrific yeah. terrific um did you get a chance um, to see the rest of the country while you were here or was it just Melbourne no I just focused on Melbourne. Yeah, yeah. well, it is the best city in Australia, so I can't blame you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, um, and for us, it's it's a big thing that um, there's a big Maldives community because um, it's a, again, it's home away from home. Um, I remember coming to Australia and finding Kinney, you know, and finding Pastitsi, which are things which are um, local. Even just going up to the to the stores. Uh, I hear just the, the Maltese language everywhere and people recognize my accent as Maltese. So it just felt like I was always welcome. And, and I just want to say thanks to, to anyone who's watching who has Maltese roots or knows people with Maltese roots for supporting us as a band throughout this experience. 
That is so cool to hear. I didn't know that at all. So thanks for that little anecdote. <laughs> um, one last question, uh, and it's for each of you. When you pack for Liverpool, what's one thing that you're going to be putting in your luggage that like you're you really need to not forget? What's the most important thing that you're going to be taking with you to Liverpool? My saxophone. <laughs> that would help. There might be a problem if you forget that one. What about yeah. the usual ball? Uh, probably my laptop mm -hmm. um, for some last minute, last minute uh, stuff that we might have to do whilst we're there. Um, uh, and my in ears. Yeah, very important. And what about you, Dave? My sweater. Yeah, <laughs> well, I've got a spare here if you need it. It just might take a few weeks <laughs> if you need me to mail it to the UK. <laughs> um thank you boys so much for making the time i'm so grateful um and i'm really really excited to see how you're going go in liverpool you have got a fan here in australia and me and i know you have many many others here in australia so um good luck and just i am so excited to see what you do and where you go and what you use the eurovision platform to do in future so thanks so much for your thank time you guys and catch you later thank you yeah, thank you bye bye, bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.